flavor uh, is one of the big uh, concerns uh, of the bill, and, and so, so let's get it out of the way uh, at the beginning. Um, we read a lot from the vaping community, and I've been following how, um, and, and many campaigns, you know, they're taking away flavors, you're taking away my flavor, and that helped me stop smoking. And it is a misconception, as you said yourself, you know, like the flavors will not be banned, the named will be changed, and the promotion of <coughs> names uh, targeted to kids uh, are what we're trying to achieve here. So, so I guess I want to have your opinion because my um, and your view on that, because my thinking and understanding of it is that probably there will be a transition because if the name changes, uh, a consumer will need to learn the new name, and, and, but that's only temporary. And in the end, isn't it more important to protect um, our youth? Uh, I would say that um, mm -hmm. flavors are very important to the experience from, from, vape, from smoking to vaping. Uh, every vapor has gone through that transition and has used flavor, be it fruit, dessert, uh, tobacco, uh, it, it's it, what makes us stop stops us from relapsing into going back to smoking. Uh, to get to your point, uh, I would suggest that when you say uh, candy or a dessert name should be changed because youth may like that. Well, youth like many like like many flavors that adults like. Now, when I go into my vape shop and I want to get an apple pie flavor or a uh, another candy flavor. And he says, well, I'm sorry, but I, I can't put that name on there because some kid might like it. Well, I'm sorry, but I want to know exactly what I'm, I'm purchasing. As like any consumer, if you go into a liquor store and you look for uh, uh, a, uh, a drink that has uh, apple pie in it, you don't go in, into a liquor store and say, see nothing that says uh, apple pie and it has some other name that denotes that particular uh, item. It would, be, it would be very confusing, and I would be actually upset because it's a, it's a real name. Because some youth might like the same thing, well, youth li like a lot of things that we like too, especially flavors. Uh, it's, it's the thing, like, like ice cream, like, like anything. So uh, I think that when you put a product out that says ice cream or apple pie, well, that's what it is. You don't change the name because some kid might like it. That, that's a position, uh, Jenny. I, I agree with you. Ms. Tilson. Sorry, go ahead. Actually, I'd like to address um, the senator. It's our understanding that it's not the names that would be changed. It's, it's the inherent flavors. So um, we're not against flavorings for, to, uh, for nicotine products. It's just ones that are overtly targeting uh, children, such as candy and dessert, uh, wouldn't be acceptable. And there's a whole range of crazy named flavors out there that nobody knows, like unicorn puke and all sorts of crazy things that, uh, you know, no adult really would be attracted to. But... Um, so I think it's in that realm where it gets a bit tricky. Uh, we're going no, to... Mr. Jones, we're not going to get in oh, to debate <laughs> on witnesses, okay? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Senator Petty-Claire. Do you uh, have sufficient uh, response on your question? Thank you. Uh, Senator Seidman to be followed by uh, Senator Eggleton. Question um, for you, Mr. Jones, and as well as you for uh, Ms. Tilson. The questions are different, so is that possible? State them at the same, State them at the same time. Oh, okay. Thank you, um, <laughs> um, Mr. Jones. You say in your presentation to us that the act of vaping is not smoking. There's no combustion or tobacco, and of course that's quite true. And so you say nicotine is not tobacco and you use this as some um, rationale for your argumentation to us. Um, however, what we do know is that nicotine is a highly addictive substance, highly addictive substance. And, in fact, it can be toxic. So, even deadly, depending on the concentration. Um, so, Bill S-5 doesn't establish standardized levels of nicotine for the liquid used in vaping. Would you recommend safeguards 
around the liquid ingredients, <laughs> specifically standards for nicotine levels? I certainly agree there should be safety standards set. And I think um, ECTA, which uh, is going to be um, talking tomorrow, uh, is the standards and regulations for e-liquids uh, for that type of requirement. Uh, but safe to say that, yes, nicotine can be addictive, but we found out that nicotine in cigarettes are highly addictive because of the way that the cigarette companies have made them because they've added extra chemicals. We've noticed that within the vaping community, most vapors start at, <clears throat> at a certain level, and they decrease their nicotine levels down to zero in most cases. In my, my, my case, I went from 24 down to zero. If it was as, as, as addictive as people would say, then I would not be able to do that. And the same condition applies for nicotine replacement therapy, like gums and, and, um, and patches <clears throat> that also have and contain nicotine. They are used to, to uh, bring people down down to, uh, to a zero and for cessation. So to say that nicotine is highly addictive, it, it depends on in, in which cases you mean. Okay. Um, Ms. Beck wants to come in, and as a result, I'll put you on the second Okay. Round. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, point out that nicotine technology is changing rapidly, and though, although some of the current products on the market might not be able to deliver, um, we can expect that with third generation and as the technology changes, they will better and better and better be able to mimic uh, the tobacco or the, the nicotine delivery that a cigarette currently delivers. And so in one respect, that's really exciting because it's going to make um, them even more effective for us as, as a cessation product. But on the flip side of that, we do need to be very careful um, in terms of um, them being in the wrong hands. Uh, Senator Eggleton to be followed by Senator Stewart Olson. Well, I think the, the major issue we're probably going to be dealing with is the vaping uh, concern about uh, youth versus smoking cessation. So I want to ask, I, I've got Mr. Jones' views quite clearly here on, on the matter, but I want, I want to hear a little bit more from the Non-Smokers Rights Association because I, 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 while you uh, support uh, uh, vaping being covered in the legislation, being regulated, you, all, you also talked about it in terms of cessation uh, program, that it has advantages uh, for people to get off of uh, regular tobacco cigarettes. So uh, the concern is, uh, th in terms of these flavors, this seems to be, and I've heard this before, not just from Mr. Jones, but I've heard it before, that that seems to be a major factor in people deciding to go the route of e-cigarettes or the vaping. Uh, and yet, there's the concern that it might be attractive to children, but Mr. Jones says, well, there's no evidence that uh, children are smoking anymore, that there's record uh, low levels of youth and adult smoking, in fact. While the vaping is increasing, that doesn't seem to be increasing. So maybe the evidence doesn't quite back up the fact that maybe children are, are susceptible to this. I don't know. But I, I, I'd like your comment on that. I'd like to know how do we, how do we square that? How are we going to um, be able to provide for legislation that could help people to get off cigarette smoking without uh, it becoming a gateway, as is frequently said, uh, for, for young people. Ms. Tilson. So there are a number of uh, parts to the answer. Flavoring is definitely one piece of the puzzle. Um, and we, we believe strongly that the legislation needs to balance risks to young people um, taking up vaping and becoming addicted to the nicotine and vaping, regardless of whether vaping products are a gateway to cigarettes. That's a, another whole issue. Um, but at the same time, as we said, we want these products available to help smokers get off the most dangerous form of nicotine, which is cigarettes. So flavoring is one aspect where these products are appealing to children. There are various studies and surveys that show that it's the flavoring that entices them to try these products. So has Health Canada arrived at a perfect solution, a perfect compromise? I don't think such a thing exists. Um, we know that fruit flavors are appealing to children, but they're also a very common choice amongst vapors. So we don't support a ban on fruit flavors, but we do support what the regulation is proposing, or the legislation is proposing, which is a ban on confectionery 
candy flavors. Um, there's no reason for a vaping product to be in a, a gummy bear flavor in order for there to be sufficient flavored choices available for adults that want to use these products. We also have proposed a number of restrictions on promotion. We don't think there should be unfettered promotion of a product that is addictive. And although it is safer than smoking, uh, that doesn't mean there shouldn't be controls. And hence our, our strong recommendation that regulatory authority be added to the bill that would allow the government to adjust permitted forms of promotion down the road, which could mean liberalizing or restricting depending on what happens when, with youth uptake and with, with quitting. So there are a lot of unknowns, and the data from the UK does not necessarily reflect the data here or in the US in terms of youth experimentation with these products. And when e-cigarettes with nicotine are legalized, we will, we will have a different situation. Big tobacco that produces some of these products will in all likelihood be entering the market. Uh, we will take one from your group on any given answer, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Stewart Olson to be followed by Senator Neufeld. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for being here. Um, I, I have real concerns over the legislation. I'll be absolutely direct with you. And I also, um, I would like your comments uh, from, from both, if you wouldn't mind, from both groups on the leg this legislation is really uh, driving people towards vaping. We don't know that much about vaping. Uh, certainly with nicotine in the vaping, I'm, very, I'm concerned that, that it's, it's just changing one addiction for another. And, we, and people are saying, well, it's less harmful, but we don't know that. People didn't know that it was, it was harmful to smoke tobacco for years. And I think, I think we have to consider that anything you take into your lungs uh, is, is a potentially dangerous uh, drug. So I'd like your comments on that, please. Mr. Jones first, and then uh, I'll go to Ms. Beck. Um, yes. Um, we have 37,000 people that's, that die each year from smoking. <clears throat> Are we happy with allowing that to happen year over year? We, we do know that after 10 years of, of, of data for vaping, it is certainly a lot less harmful to those people who have switched. So with any uh, people that actually quit smoking for vaping, that has to be much better than the, than the status quo of those people dying as we have now. So I think that, yes, vaping is not benign. It's not 100% safe, nothing is. However, it is something that will actually allow people <clears throat> to get their requirements should they use nicotine. And as I said before, a lot of vapors go down from a certain amount of nicotine down to zero. My own son quit smoking and he quit vaping. So is, this, is, this is a proven fact. There's thousands of vapors, there's probably hundreds of thousands of vapors in, in Canada and across the world, millions that have tried this and are doing the same thing because they don't want to smoke anymore. We are not smokers. And I think people have to realize that we are not smokers, okay? And, and vaping is not smoking. And that's a big thing that people have to realize. Ms. Beck? Thank you. Um, the evidence is still emerging. We don't have a robust body of evidence like we do for tobacco, um, but we do have a lot of experience in studying tobacco. And so the evidence is quite clear that e-cigarettes are less harmful. But as Melody said, the spirited debate is around the degree of less harm. Is it really 95% as we often hear? I think I was just at a meeting with Health Canada and international experts were agreeing it's probably well, the, the consensus is more in the 60 to 80 percent realm, which um, gives us unparalleled opportunity to really make a difference in, in this epidemic that we're facing. Um, 
Nicotine replacement therapy is effective in certain cases when it's used with counseling, etc. There are barriers, um, but you don't see groups forming f organizations cheering around nicotine replacement therapy. This is um, a totally different ball game, and I think you're right. Um, we we still don't know all of the details around what's in the vape, but I think we've got enough information that we 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 need to move on this. Lives are at stake, and uh, as more evidence becomes clear we can hone our regulations based on what Melody said so um, you're right but uh, this is an opportunity we can't miss. Thank you. Senator uh, Newfeld to be followed by Senator Greenrain. Thank you. <coughs> so <coughs> I, I've, I haven't smoked for 33 years uh, but when I did smoke I didn't buy a package of cigarettes because of the package was pretty. I bought them because I wanted cigarettes and smoked cigarettes. So I, I'm just a little bewildered why, why I think there's a real deterrent to the pictures that they have on cigarette packages now, to be perfectly honest, of what can happen if you smoke. Why would it, why would clear, or, or packaging that's plain help a person not smoke? I, I just don't get the correlation. I mean, if, if you see someone without a throat or their mouth half gone on a pitcher of cigarettes, I think that would deter you more than just a plain package. I didn't understand that. Ms. Tilson? Thank you very much for the question. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to answer that. Um, Packaging is the last bastion of marketing that's available to tobacco companies in this country and in various other countries such as Australia and the UK where plain packaging has already been implemented. If you haven't smoked in, in decades, you probably haven't been up close and personal with a cigarette pack. You might be surprised how they've changed. This is what a cigarette pack looks like nowadays. So those huge graphic warnings that my own organization and many other health groups fought really hard for, well, they're practically illegible and invisible. There's no in-your-face ugly graphic here. There's a pretty little package, and inside the pretty little package, there's more pretty colorings that belie the toxic nature and addictive nature of the product inside. So one of the things that plain and standardized packaging would do is make the warning graphic and visual and stand out again. And there are all kinds of studies, dozens and dozens of studies from different countries that show one of the most important aspects of plain and standardized packaging is to make the warning um, more salient to make smokers pay more attention to the warning, to make non-smokers who see a package lying around take heed of this warning. The industry uses all kinds of different design features to downplay the warning. Here's another recent pack. This is called a side push pack. This is standalone. It can go in your purse or your pocket just like this. Guess what? There's no warning. There's no warning on this package, which is mandated by law in Canada. So there are many workarounds to, to undermine the effectiveness of package warnings. The other thing tobacco companies have done is use colors to imply that certain brand variants are are um, lighter, we banned the term lighter, but they use more white on the packaging, lighter colors, more uh, different brand descriptors, and I could go on and on to suggest to smokers, you don't need to quit, switch from that robust red colored package to a lighter colored package and you will be smoking a lighter cigarette which which means less tar and again there are dozens of studies from all over the world that show that this is in fact what smokers believe when the packages come in different colors smokers also believe that little packages like this hold less harmful products than big packages like this so there are many things that plain and standardized packaging could do and the last point I'd like to make is it makes no sense on logical grounds or ethical grounds that a product that is highly addictive and that kills one out of every two long-term users should be allowed to be sold in attractive branded packages. Governments need to do everything they possibly can to get people not to start and to help them make the decision to quit. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Green Rain to be followed by Senator <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm very curious. Um, um, two things. <clears throat> First of all, um, for Mr. Jones, 
Um, how, how is your um, your organization uh, organized? Is it uh, do uh, people who vape uh, buy a membership, or how is how is your your organization set up, and how is it funded? <coughs> well, we're all um, uh, directors on our board. Um, we have pub public advisors, and then we have a membership of, of 1,200. Um, we are all 100% volunteers, and we represent the consumers of Canada. I, I'm sure you're volunteers, but there must be some expenses incurred by the organization. So, so w for the 1,200 people who join, do they pay a membership fee? No, do they, they pay do an not. annual fee? No, they do not. They are members of our uh, Facebook website. Okay, so where does the revenue come for your organization to exist? A lot of it comes out of our own pockets. Mm -hmm. We pay a lot of our own expenses because we are volunteers. We believe in what we're doing. So we don't charge any money uh, to our members to be with us because we're trying to help everybody to uh, get off smoking. So that's what our rationale is. Thank you. The other question I would have would, would be for... for um, uh, well, for both groups, and that is um, looking down the line, uh, as you know, our government intends to legalize marijuana. What is your uh, concern? Do you have any concern about uh, the marijuana flavor uh, being vaped uh, by children and, and marijuana itself being vaped as opposed to smoked? And so I'm concerned about the age that we're embedding in this as being perhaps too young when it comes to marijuana. Uh, you a very quick answer. This is outside this uh, bill, so uh, uh, there is actually um, just provide in the bill. There's um, uh, marijuana flavoring is uh, banned, and once the uh, legislation comes into effect for marijuana, it in turn would address the issues around e-cigarettes. Exactly. Thank you, uh, Senator Frum. To be followed by Senator Hartley. Um, Ms. Tilson, I just want to invite you to um, ex amplify on your suggestions for amendments. You went through them pretty quickly. And one of them you, you mentioned about th that there maybe is a need to also regulate other related vaping-related products. And as a non-vapor, I'm not sure I know what those are. Can you explain that a little bit? Uh, Rothman's, Vincent and Hedges just introduced a new product in the last month or so called Icos, which is a hybrid product between tobacco and vaping. So it has tobacco in it, but it also doesn't combust. And this is just the beginning of a whole new generation of these hybrid products. I mentioned the technology is changing quickly, and it's not just this company. It's all three big tobacco companies. And so we need to be prepared to make sure that our legislation is going to be able to capture all of these new products. And Health Canada has advised that ICOS will be captured as a tobacco product. But as these products become uh, more obscure and, and so forth, we just need to make sure that the legislation doesn't allow for any cracks. And so we're recommending that the definition of tobacco be expanded. And we're pleased to see that there's regulatory authority um, under the definition of a vaping product to include any product as a vaping product. So did you have Thank you. Uh, Senator uh, Hartling. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, I'm just wondering, I know we're quite aware that secondhand smoke does affect us. And I'm just wondering in the vaping products, do you know if there's any research been done on the vaping stuff that comes out to the user or to other people? Is there any, any research on that? Either of you know? Well, actually, there's quite a lot of uh, information that's come over, out over the last uh, couple of years. Yes. Uh, obviously, it's been uh, one of those major concerns in terms of you know, what is uh, coming out. Obviously, it's not benign. There are certainly some uh, chemicals that do come out, but the latest research that's come out has shown that uh, the level of exposure to the bystander is at such a low level that it should not harm bystanders. I think that we've, we've actually said... Uh, Said that, sent that in as part of our submission as to the latest um, studies. Um, <clears throat> and also for the vapor, the vapor gets what that person needs, which either is a little bit of nicotine or no nicotine, but it's the actual habit of using a vaping to just enjoy themselves. You have to remember, vaping has two aspects. One is, is to enjoy themselves, have to be the same as, as, as smoking, but it's not smoking. The other aspect is that you can use it for cessation. 
I said my own son used it for cessation and quit both. So there's two aspects to this. You know, just like somebody that likes coffee or, or decaffeinated, same idea. Yeah, I understand, but I'm just wondering about, just thinking about <coughs> effects on other people around, children or breastfeeding mothers or things like that. There, there, have, there has been some um, studies on that, uh, and we can certainly give you some more information about that. But right now, the, the levels that they've identified have been at low levels. It all depends on how the actual um, vaping is used. Okay, and some of the studies show that high levels, but that's because it's not in real world and it's not used by real vapors. So they kind of build it up which, and scare people without using real information. The information is um, building. It uh, remains inconclusive, but I do agree uh, with David Jones that um, from what we see so far, the toxins within the vapor are um, in trace amounts, um, but the science as it stands it is riddled with methodological problems, and so um, we need to be uh, cognizant of that. And our organization is advocating that smoke-free spaces stay as smoke-free and vape-free. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, it's a false comparison to say that vape is less harmful than secondhand smoke. All of our environments are smoke-free right now, and so we don't want to see a chemical introduced into the environment of questionable, you know, an, until we know more about it. And the other um, issue is that smokers have been able to abstain in smoke-free environments, mm -hmm. and so to suddenly begin to vape, be permitted to vape um, indoors, is a, is a step backwards for individual smokers, and it's an indiv or vapors, and it's an individual, or it's a step backwards for public health as well. Thank you. Senator McFedron to be followed uh, by Senator Petticlair. Thank you so much. Um, this is a question uh, to Mr. Jones, and, and um, certainly uh, um, your colleague, you're welcome to answer as well. But I was very struck by how you answered the question about the funding for your activities. And I didn't hear you say that you pay personally for all of your expenses. So my question is to just understand more clearly the sources of funding for your activities um, are promoting vaping. And let me be more specific. Do you receive any funding to your organizational efforts from retailers? Do you receive any funding for your organizational efforts, including uh, presentations such as today, from producers of vaping products or anything related to vaping? Absolutely not. This is purely out-of-pocket expense. Yep. <clears throat> so, so you pay on an individual basis as volunteers for all of your expenses for your organization, everything related to any advertising, travel, That's correct. everything yes. you pay as volunteers. That's yes. right. <clears throat> That's right. We represent the consumers. So for us to accept funds from organizations that may do harm to our, cons our, our membership, then that would be a conflict, I'm afraid, and that we will not entertain. And are you both or one uh, uh, founders of your organization? No. I was one of the original founders with uh, a couple of other people. Uh, so this is one of our positions is that we are for the consumer. We have no conflicts of interest, so we do not accept anything from, as we said in, originally, we don't have any conflicts of interest with, with um, tobacco or vape industry or pharmaceutical in industry. So we have no conflicts there. Mm -hmm. and that, We stand by that statement. And did your organization commission any of the research that you've tabled with us or uh, contribute to the We, we have taken all those uh, studies, et cetera, from, uh, uh, from experts and international experts in the field, such as the University of Victoria um, study mm -hmm. that's coming out. Uh, a couple of other major ones are actually uh, peer-reviewed and out on uh, in the World Web. So there are a lot of um, uh, resources that we access to be able to provide those types of studies to this committee. But we do not commission anything except we do ask if they do have find something, yes, we'd like to know. Thank, thank you. you. Senator Petticler to be followed by Senator Stephen. Merci. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all your answers. I, I would like to hear you um, 
especially the non-smokers' right association, but, but you know, feel free to add um, on therapeutic claims. Um, we know that uh, nicotine products, of course, um, have to meet standards for quality, safety, efficiency. Um, this has to go through the Food and Drugs Act, um, in order to make claims like, you know, this product will help you quit smoking, for example. So I, I read that you do consider that uh, making uh, this process is too long uh, for your taste. Uh, and I do, be, but I think we all agree that the process is necessary. So, so I do want to hear you a little more on, on uh, what you think about the process itself, or is it only the length of the process that you are concerned with, and, and, and what would be the best scenario um, in order to address those possible therapeutic claims? Thank you. Yes, we are concerned about the dual route to market. We're concerned that because of the cost and the length of time, by the time a therapeutic product was uh, authorized as so, it would be actually out of date um, and, uh, and outmoded because the technology is changing so quickly. Um, however, we do recognize the need for proper claims and we don't want um, any old product making claims that are false. Um, I think that uh, uh, this is why we come back to relative risk because it could be that we have no products on the therapeutic side, um, so there are no products out there that are helping giving smokers accurate information about their relative risks. Now, within um, uh, the bill, uh, it calls for. Um, sorry, I'm Melody. Do you want to jump in? I'm having a. So. We realize there's a really fine line that needs to be um, walked here between consumers having the information they need on which to base a decision to use or not to use vaping products and, on the other hand, allowing companies to make um, deceptive or misleading claims. So what we're proposing is that companies be allowed to make a relative risk statement that's been approved by Health Canada, companies, uh, products that haven't gone through the therapeutic route. The, the challenge is if you don't allow uh, vaping companies to say anything about the fact that these products are less harmful than smoking or that they may be of some assistance in smoking cessation, then what the companies are left with is marketing these products as lifestyle accessories. And we've seen a lot of that type of marketing in Canada over the last five years or so while there was this um, well, while well, vaping products with nicotine were illegal and yet still available. And we don't think that serves anyone's interest. We do not want these to become the next sexy accoutrement when you're going out for the evening. Um, that doesn't help smokers and it certainly doesn't help young people. And so um, a limited range of vetted information that these products are safer, that there is no combustion, there is no, um, there is no smoke, that type of thing um, we would think would be beneficial on products and on promotion. Thank you. Senator Seidman to be followed by... I agree with that position as well. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Senator Seidman to be followed by Senator Eggleton. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, I, I'd like to follow up on what you just said, Ms. Tilson. Um, so... It's interesting, and it is the case that some would say that vaping devices should only be used for therapeutic purposes in smoking cessation, no other use at all. What would you say about that? In an ideal world, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We would only want smokers using these products, smokers who are trying to quit. Um, we don't have an ideal world. We have companies out there that are trying to make a profit, and we have um, a society that, where people are drawn to products that are addictive. Um, so I think what this legislation, as I mentioned before, tries to do is balance what, um, what the country needs in terms of protecting youth and helping smokers. We want smokers to stop using a product that's killing half of them. And for every smoker, every one of the 37,000 Canadians who die every year because of their tobacco use, there are about 20 more that are suffering from a tobacco-caused disease. And that has to end. This is one possible way of reducing the death toll. And 
at the same time, I don't want my children getting addicted to nicotine because vaping products are everywhere and they come in all of these attractive um, devices and with attractive flavors. So one of our strongest recommendations is that the, the types of promotion that vapors have said they want, where they can be, they can try a product, they can be told how to use it, they can see products displayed, etc., only be permitted in specialty vape shops that are off limits to minors. So e-cigarette sales with nicotine, vaping product sales with nicotine, promoted only in specialty vape shops. Um, <clears throat> if I could just follow up just with one more. Quickly. Yeah. Um, These are the critics. And the, so and the, I, I think you've been asked this already, and certainly Mr. Jones has, but I, I would like to hear from, um, from, your, from you um, uh, on the issue of a gateway for youth. Because you yourself have said, you know, uh, nicotine is addictive. You don't want your kids getting addicted to nicotine. Um, and some are concerned, sorry, yeah, some are concerned that um, this will renormalize smoking for a whole new generation of kids. What would you say to that? Did you want to direct that to Mr. Jones? No, I want to okay, direct it to, to Ms. Gilson. So there isn't a lot of evidence to date that the availability of vaping products with nicotine is renormalizing smoking. But it's an evolving landscape. And if we allowed vaping in all the places where we banned smoking, I think the risk would be higher. If we sold, if we allowed the sale of vaping products with nicotine everywhere in any unregulated flavor, I think the risks would be higher. But I also think it's important to separate the risk of nicotine addiction amongst young people with, from the risk of this being a gateway product to cigarettes. Thank you. Senator Eggleton. Uh, this time I'll ask Mr. Jones a, a question. The, um, you, you, you've given your views with respect to flavors uh, and the importance of uh, vaping in terms of uh, cessation programs. But there is also the question of advertising. So can I ask you about would you support a ban on e-cigarette advertising on TV and radio? Would you support a ban on e-cigarette advertising, branding of T-shirts or baseball hats and stuff like various other products like that. Generally a ban on lifestyle advertising for e-cigarettes. Would you support those measures? I, I would suggest that certainly advertising on, on, uh, on media uh, after a certain hour, just like anything else for adults, uh, also to be able to show those types of promotions in adult venues is certainly use, is certainly uh, correct. We're talking about a product that is aimed at adults. So hopefully the, ch the children would not be able to see or go into those particular venues that are adult only. Um, as to banning um, hats and, uh, uh, and t-shirts, that is, that is a, a freedom of expression type thing, I think. Uh, it certainly has a, a I would not like to see my kids to see that, but that's something, one of those things that we'd always see most of the time on, on T-shirts and advertising. I wouldn't say that we should be saying, buy this or buy that on that T-shirt, but to uh, have a, a logo, well, it depends on how you determine what is uh, okay for youth. I, I really couldn't say what is, what is uh, a position on youth. As I said before, what's good for one, might not be good for another person to determine what is Thank a, a youth. I'll go to Ms. Beck. One of our key asks is for regulatory authority to be placed over advertising and promotion so that we can fine tune it and be guided as the evidence emerges. We do not support lifestyle advertising uh, for e-cigarettes at all, just like we don't uh, want it and, or see it for tobacco. Um, there's no need for that. I think informational and brand preference advertising will be sufficient to be able to convince smokers to try e-cigarettes and hopefully switch. Um, and uh, we don't want to see any brand stretching either. So the bill uh, already includes uh, no, no tobacco brands on vapor products. 
and also we want to make sure that we don't see uh, vapor brands on baseball hats and cell phone cases and all that kind of thing. There's no need for it. I think that smokers will be able to get the information that they need through the various promotions and advertising without having um, it out there. We're not looking to expand the market. We want a very targeted market, and those are adult smokers. Thank you.